Welcome guys, Madsimus here with you today. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. So recently, a question popped into the back of my mind is, how does infantry work with armoured battle groups nowadays, and how effective are they in doing so? And another kind of question popped in the back of my head, and kind of a rhetorical question, and one of which is kind of subjective to everybody's own personal opinion, but is infantry in the modern day battlefield becoming the new tip of the spear when it comes to armoured formations in the battlefield? Now, we all know that armoured formations will always have infantry supporting them, they go hand in hand. And we all know that tanks are absolutely awesome. They are the big monsters that dominate the battlefield, their main guns can usually destroy multiple targets and some of the toughest targets on the battlefield, and their machine guns can decimate enemy infantry formations quite easily. They even sound big and mean and vicious, I mean they have a dominating power on the battlefield, and they are the king of the battlefield in some regards when it comes to ground warfare, however the infantry are their queen, and as I mentioned they go hand in hand. When tanks attack they are truly fear inspiring, even veteran troops don't like the tanks unless they are friendly tanks. The first tank was born in World War 1, initially they were designed as mobile pillboxes, armoured machine gun carriers, and they have evolved a great deal since then. Originally they were designed to assist infantry, and they still do, and quite well I might add. There are several problems with this however. Unlike infantry, they cannot sneak up on you. They are often restricted to what terrain they can travel through, and normally the movie portrays in the Hollywood scene an unstoppable monster that can drive through houses and trees like they weren't even there. Guys, this just isn't true. While a tank may win a pushing contest against a house if a house was to collapse on in it, it would fall on the tank, maybe trapping the tank, and furthermore, all the rubble would cause the tank to slip a track and then the track is not going anywhere. If the building does fall on the tank and pin it in place, you can be bet the crew is going to have a hell of a time getting out without help. Like I said, tanks are also very noisy. First of all, their overpowered engine has to move tons of metal around the battlefield, and there's a squeal of metal tracks, the diesel turbos, the gas turbine engines squeal, Everything is very, very loud. Even the newer tanks like the US M1 have engines that make a lot less noise now, but still produce quite a bit of audible detection for other enemy battle groups. What this amounts to is tanks cannot sneak up on people. Even an artillery barrage cannot always conceal the appearance of tanks. A tank might, if he is approaching from downwind, have some other masking noise like artillery approaching to within a few hundred meters of the enemy without being detected. Armoured warfare is very similar to infantry tactics. Tanks usually operate in pairs similar to like battle buddies or even fighter aircraft. One tank moves while the other tank watches and provides cover. Now the best way to kill a tank is, for the most part, to use another tank. Failing that, aircraft or infantry are your second and third options. Because tanks are expensive, they usually are well protected from aircraft by anti-aircraft guns and missile systems mounted on special vehicles or platforms. Infantry though are another story entirely. Infantry are the nemesis of tanks, and there is a love-hate relationship with them. Tanks hate infantry and infantry hate tanks, yet when the two are on the same side, they love each other and go hand in hand. Tanks destroy targets that are too tough for most infantry emplacements and infantry platoons, and infantry keep the tanks safe from other infantry. Most Israeli tank casualties were inflicted by infantry during the Yom Kippur War. This is a key example of why infantry are starting to become just as important as tanks when engaging other tanks. Attacking is what tanks are primarily designed for. Their frontal armour is thickest to the front, and all of their weapons are primarily focused towards the forward portion of the vehicle, and most of the time anything in front of the tank is going to have a very, very bad day. The sides, rear, top and bottom of the tank are another story completely. Although they are usually well armoured, the armour is not nearly as thick as the front. That is why infantry like to attack tanks from nearly any direction but the front. Plus tanks have no qualms about running over infantry if they can't shoot them up, and infantry knows this. Because large viewpoints will make the tank vulnerable to rockets and enemy cannons, the viewpoints have to be small. This means that when a crew is hiding behind the armour, they can't see very well. In fact, if an infantryman can get within 10 meters of most soviet build old tanks, then the tanker cannot even see him unless he sneaks his head out of the vehicle. Also, to minimize the weak points in the armor, the main guns are limited to how high and low they can elevate. This means that if an infantryman can get within 20 feet of the tank, the tanker and its crew technically cannot shoot him with any of the main gun weapons. The tanker can still try to run over the poor guy if the tanks can move fast enough. They also have the ability to use the out-mounted vehicle weapons, however you risk being engaged by the infantryman yourself. This is why tanks must have infantry when going into assaults. 
Now this is something we already know, it's nothing new, we know tanks and infantry work side by side. But it seems now, in the modern day environment, that infantry are starting to become just as much of a threat as another tank is to another tank on the battlefield. Enemy infantrymen of the rear and the flanks of the tank can be a huge threat. If a tank has infantry to keep off pesky enemy infantry, the tank becomes a true terror. Obviously, infantry of the friendly force can shoot at the enemy infantry on or near friendly tanks without fear, because tanks are clearly bulletproof in the sense that, basically, any ammunition caliber that you place from an infantry weapon system is going to kill the enemy infantry and not the tank. There is one problem with having infantry protecting tanks though. This is that tanks can drive a heck of a lot faster and further than the infantrymen can run. With that being said, it defeats the purpose of having a vehicle that could travel very quickly if it is pushing way too fast ahead of the dismounted infantry that is trying to protect it. Once again, this reiterates the point of the tank being very difficult to be able to support one another on the battlefield with both infantry and armour. If the tanks are pushing too far ahead to the tip of the spear, the infantry are unable to support those tanks going into the battlefield and preventing from being attacked from anti-tank guided weapon systems, laws, milans, whatever else that may be out there to take them out. And this is where armoured personnel carriers and infantry fighter vehicles come into play. APCs are primarily designed to keep up with the tanks and carry infantry safely until they are needed. The infantry inside the APC are protected from all sorts of battlefield nasties like mortars and small arms fire. APCs may mount some weapons but these are usually limited and APCs are mostly amphibious. An IFE or infantry fighting vehicle is designed to transport the infantry and fight alongside them. IFEs are not tanks though as we already know and they are basically just a more heavily armed APC designed to fight alongside the infantry. Units composed of IFEs and infantry are classified as mechanized or armored infantry, and this is what I mean by being the new tip of the spear. If tanks are able to do the job against other tanks very easily, with troops that can now mobilize very quickly alongside the tanks, we have quite a substantial force there. We can multiply the use of one vehicle to produce 12 assets that can engage 12 tanks. Now yes, one tank can engage 12 tanks, but the likelihood of a tank being able to engage 12 tanks very quickly, unlike a section of 12 infantrymen could with anti-tank weapons, is very slim. The APC was born in World War II in the form of the half-track. The problem with half-tracks was they didn't really have any overhead protection. The Soviets were the first to deploy IFEs after World War II. Tanks and IFEs are designed to work together. The infantry supported by the IFEs keeps the enemy infantry off the tanks while the tanks can destroy the enemy. Infantry also provide many benefits to the tankers because tanks are maintenance intensive and crews are very small. Infantry can provide security to the tank crews while they repair or maintain their vehicles. If no infantry are available, then there are one or more of the crew can stand guard while the others work. It also means the crew gets less sleep because they must have security details to cover them. Exhausted tank crews have many opportunities in the battlefield to make fatal mistakes. Tanks have the armor to protect them against a frontal assault but not attack from the sides, tops, rear and bottom as mentioned before. If they did, they probably wouldn't need the infantry as much, but design specifications are against having too much armor. Different weight specifications, a lot of cost, and besides, you cannot put armor on tracks of a tank because basically the tank would not be able to move and a stationary tank is the biggest target on the battlefield. In World War II, there were some special anti-tank grenades that were designed to be thrown on top of tanks. The grenade would land on top of the tank and explode on the weaker top armor. Since the armor has become too thick for grenades, bigger grenades could be built and they would be far too heavy to throw effectively. Now tanks are usually supposed to maintain around a 100 meters distance between one another. This does not happen in most trains, however, like the desert. Usually, natural terrain will force the tanks to move in a prescribed manner, and that is what the infantry love to see tanks do, because they can channel them into kill boxes and use weapon systems just like the javelin to knock them out. A city, for example, forces the tank to use streets, which is one of the worst areas for a tank to be in. It is vulnerable from the top, sides, and rear. Enemy infantry inside buildings hide and let the tanks pass by. Then, whenever they want to, the enemy infantry tend to open fire on the weaker sides and rear of the tanks and can throw just about any kind of munition down onto the tanks, such as a Molotov cocktail, which can create a burning liquid and seep down into the engine through the vents. A debate has raged for years about which who should go first, tanks or infantry. That debate is still going on today. 
It depends on the military environment that they've been working in and the kind of battlefield they are, but if the tank leads the way all the time, there may be fewer casualties among the infantry, but more chance of losing a tank to enemy mines, anti-tank rounds or traps. If infantry lead the way, the tanks may be safer, but there'll be higher casualties among infantry coming across more infantry, which the tanks primarily should be trying to engage from a distance. In wooded or some other restrictive terrains, tanks and IFEs will usually travel in single files. This reduces the chance of running into minefields, and as the column gets close to the enemy, they will break up into smaller columns to avoid ambushes and the like. Before the columns reach the enemy, they will break apart and form lines, with armoured personnel carriers about 100 metres behind the tank line. The infantry will then dismount and move forward on foot. If the infantry are not needed to tangle with the enemy infantry, they will usually remain safely in their APCs or IFEs. During all this, artillery will usually be pounding the enemy positions in an attempt to kill them, demoralise them and conceal the approach of the tanks. The enemy may, if they are smart, be returning the favour against the attacking tanks and infantry. It is the attacker's goal to attack a weakened section of the enemy. Flanks are nice, but not always practical. The mobility of tanks and IFEs give them that ability to move rapidly around the battlefield in an attempt to catch the enemy by surprise. The longer an assault takes, the more chance there is the enemy may receive reinforcements, call in artillery, or any other cumber of nasty things, like aircraft. Opposing forces normally have a reserved mechanized force of their own that they can send around the battlefield rapidly to cover any assaults that are critical to the mission. Retreating from a battle also may mean abandoning the infantry with the speed of the vehicles that are going on the battlefield, and that is always going to be a bad idea because the grunts will obviously take very heavy casualties. When defending the tanks, they're great. Usually the best method is for the tank to just wait behind the crest of a hill in a hull down position, and when the enemy comes within range, the tank will roll up the hill, only the turret exposed, take a shot and roll back out of sight. After firing from one position, the tank will likely move to another position and repeat the process. The Egyptians lost a large number of tanks to the Israelis in this manner, because the Israelis kept pulling back and bleeding the Egyptians dry. This does not work so well against infantry. Infantry can be very sneaky, and the main gun of a tank does not work so well against infantry in most cases. Most of the rounds carried today are primarily anti-tank, and very few, if any, are anti-personnel. When tanks are positioned in the defensive with infantry, they are usually placed behind the infantry, and primarily target enemy tanks only. Since the defenders are likely to be bombed by artillery and tanks, they are more likely to control the fire support assets, because tanks are more immune to artillery than infantry. Tanks don't do a whole lot when it comes to defending against enemy infantry, but they do work very well against, obviously, enemy tanks. But that isn't just the case with infantry. Infantry can deploy its own weapon systems that are high-tech and very deadly to able to do the exact same role as the main battle tank. With that being said, this is increasing the capability of most armoured battle groups. Not for the fact that they need more tanks, but the fact that one IFV can create a platoon of tanks, in theory, with most of the modern day weapon systems that are coming out today, we can engage just as far and just as powerful as any main battle tank with a group of troops. To defend themselves, tanks often have smoke generators and discharges and mechanisms that can be able to create a smoke screen for the vehicle. The advantage of the smoke to the tank can be very critical. Some missiles require the gunner to maintain eye contact with the tank until the missile hits. Most infantry carrying missiles today are wire guided and if the shooter loses sight of the target, the missile will lose sight of the target also. When a tanker comes under fire by an anti-tank missile, he tends to fire off as much smoke as he can and rapidly change his course in an attempt to evade the missile. If he survives, he can take a shot at the missile launcher if he doesn't find that the point of area where he shot from has changed. Rockets are another story. Once a rocket is launched from the infantry, it is gone. Smoke won't help the vehicle, but dodging will, if the tank has the time and not always the case. Smoke does not work very well if the missile launcher is equipped and using a thermal sight to track the target. Thermal images see right through the smoke. This is once again reinforcing the fact that if infantry can find a position to engage a tank, the tank is doomed. And this is kind of scary because we always see tanks as being able to dominate the battlefield and being able to take out infantry from long distances. But if infantry are in emplacements and hidden in cover that can provide attack positions onto a tank before it even gets there, the tank is kind of doomed. As mentioned a number of times now, anti-tank weapon systems are becoming far too superior to modern day armor packages that are coming out to the fact that infantry are just as capable as the tank on the battlefield. 
Another aspect of tank tactics is mines. Tanks hate mines. It's an aerial denial weapon system, and although they are technically banned from the battlefield, in some cases they are still used. Technically, all the enemy has to do is lay a bunch of mines in an opened area, place a sniper team in the area to keep the tankers from getting out if they have rolled over one, and effectively you have stopped a rapid advance. As I mentioned before, NATO doctrine does not determine the use of mines on the battlefield. That's not saying though that enemy infantry is not going to do the same against us if we did so. Mines do not have to be massive explosive either. A mine is designed technically to blow the track off the vehicle and can cause some serious harm for the fact that the tank is immobile, and therefore the infantry can manipulate that weakness, come round the sides back, or anywhere they need to to engage it and knock it out. Mix the track busters with anti-personnel mines and any tanker would look for a more different route. This can have an even more powerful effect during the battle. If minefields are created by infantry companies or sections, then they can be channeled into different areas and again, infantry can produce ambushes on those positions. With all this being said, tanks are highly unlikely to become extinct. They will remain heavily armoured and armed with a mobile weapon platform that will support the infantry in the action until the individual infantryman carries a weapon that can easily defeat a tank on its own. The moral and point of this video today, guys, is that infantry are not the supporting role so much as to the attacking role when it comes to armoured formations. Infantry now can actually be placed ahead of armoured battle groups such as tank platoons, tank companies, and provide just as much fire support and firepower than a main battle tank can. This is starting to become a lot more apparent in modern day battlefield techniques. With all the new technology and weapon systems coming out, is the tank the tip of the spear when it comes to an assault and attack onto a position? Really that question is quite subjective. There are multiple different variables that come into effect when trying to take on an enemy in the battlefield, but most commanders will be pretty common sense in using that heavy armoured vehicles going in first is going to be key but that is just not always the case. Airborne infantry or special forces can be put in place ahead of armoured battle groups or even behind enemy lines to disrupt and engage the enemy before they even get to the armour on armoured contacts. Now this is something that I've always been fascinated with, the infantry and armoured love relationship. I mean, as I said, they do go hand in hand, but it is interesting to see how doctrine is changing on how infantry operate with tanks. It's not always about now tanks going ahead and infantry being behind. Sometimes it's actually the infantry pushing well ahead of the tanks, whilst the tanks provide defensive positions, and if the infantry can't push forward enough, they can retreat back to the tanks and be able to engage. So guys, I would really like to hear your opinion on this. Do you feel that infantry should be pushing ahead of the tanks, or do you feel that tanks should be always leading ahead with the tip of the spear on any kind of operations or armoured assault? I must say that I would always side with tanks going ahead first. Yes, infantry are able to engage tanks and take them out with long distances, but primarily tank on tank is normally going to be the first engagements because that's what we have. However, Times are changing, and different aspects of battlefield warfare are changing, so it's nice to see other people's opinions. I'd love to hear your opinion on this infantry slash tank relationship. What do you think about it? Do you think that there is going to be an adjustment again? Do you think that we may side away from armour altogether? Let me know, I'd love to hear your opinion on it in the comments section below. Also guys, if you did enjoy today's video, please leave me a like, and if you are new to my channel, please subscribe. I really do appreciate you stopping by today. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great one. All the best, and bye-bye.